Ed Davey, welcome to Acting Prime Minister and thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's good to be here. You've been uh, permanent leader of the Lib Dems now for what, two months? How do you think it's going? Oh, well, I'm really uh, enjoying being able to talk to lots of people across the party about where we're going. Uh, I've had to give the party some uh, truths, namely that we've had a bit of a bad time in the last five years, three poor election results. And uh, you know, I've said, look, we've got to wake up and smell the coffee. And uh, people actually get that. And they get that we've got to get back in tune with the British people, that the British people have been sending us a message that we haven't necessarily been focusing on their issues. And I remember a time when we were a powerful, distinctive, principled voice in British politics that people really res understood and it resonated with them. And we can get back to that. But the starting point is understanding where you've got to and going out and listening. And I'm doing a listening tour around the country. You know, I've been to, started off in Stockport doing a lunchtime shift in a fish and chip shop. Uh, then I've been. That doesn't sound too bad. Oh, it was good. I like fish and chips actually. Um, but um, down into Cardiff, and I met some a, a restaurant owner and two two retailers, and I went up to Midwells and some farmers. I've been to Northeast Fife in Scotland to green tourist business there. I've been to Cheltenham. I've been to Guildford. I've been to parts of London. I'm going to St Albans tomorrow. This is going to last for month and month and months. And the key thing is going out to people's places of work, their communities, and listening, and asking them you know, what's on their minds. And I'll tell you what, already, already, the key thing is coming back. They talk about things that are different to what we talk about in Westminster. We obsess in the Westminster bubble with a whole range of things, and that's not what people out there talk about when you listen to them. Okay, well, there are 11 Lib Dem seats to, to visit. But we are, look, we're making you Prime Minister today, regardless of the fact that you've only got 11 MPs in Parliament. And we always like to get people settled into Downing Street to, to kick things off. What is the personal item you think that you would take into number 10 with you if you were Prime Minister? Well, uh, I've been moving in with my family and uh, my little boys uh, are quite disabled. And the, the, when we go out as a family, he takes his tricycle. Uh, and um, then we have our bikes, but the key thing is, is his tricycle. So it would be um, John's John's trike. I can see a photo of him behind you there as well on yeah, your is, yeah. on your virtual Zoom background. That's right. Feeding the ducks, is it that you're doing there? I think they were ducks or swans. I think they're ducks. Um, yeah, we weren't. To be honest, we weren't feeding them. We were just uh, John was having a bit of a tizzy. And uh, we were at a party. Um, uh, it was a, a friend of mine's wedding, actually. And we needed to have a bit of space. So um, I took him on the jetty to the little pond, which is very nice. Lovely. Well, well, we'll come on to talk about your son later as well. But let's get back to you being in Downing Street now. And what is the drink that you'd pour yourself, do you think? As you're going through that red box late at night, what is the tipple that you're going to reach for? Well, I had a red box when I was a minister for five years. Um, you would often, I found anyway, I'd work into the early hours. So you don't want to drink into the early hours. But I think when I would open it and uh, see what the officials had got in store for me, I'd definitely have a glass of red wine. OK. Uh, and who's the first person you'd call as prime minister? Well, I hope it'd be Joe Biden, because I hope he uh, defeats the awful Donald Trump uh, on the 3rd of November. And... Um, restore some sanity to not just American politics and government, uh, but also to in, uh, international. And we, we see an American president is prepared to work with their partners for a more secure, safe world and also to tackle climate change. OK, well, let's see what happens in November. Let's talk a bit about your path to power now. So you were born in Nottinghamshire to dad, John and mum, Nina, who were a solicitor and a teacher. Sadly, you lost both of them in childhood, your dad at the age of just four and your mum to bone cancer 11 years later. And then you moved in with your grandparents before going to Oxford University and studying PPE, graduating to become an economics researcher for the Liberal Democrats. In 1997, you were elected as an MP and went on to serve in the coalition government as Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change with uh, Nick Clegg, of course, who was Deputy Prime Minister at the time. There was a brief spell outside Parliament when you lost your seat in 2015 and then regained it in 2017. And after serving as Deputy Leader under Joe Swinson, then Acting Leader when she lost her seat, uh, this year you were named as the new permanent leader of the Liberal Democrats. And I just wanted to start by talking a bit about your childhood, because it is something that you talk about quite openly. It's sort of come to help 
shape your leadership, really, isn't it? It's come, help, come to sort of help define you as a, as a leader because you did lose your dad at such a young age. Um, what, what do you remember of him and, 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 and losing him? Well, I remember very little of him, unfortunately, and most of my memories come from the stories that my mother used to tell uh, myself and my brothers of him. Uh, I do have a recollection of being picked up from play school when uh, my dad was in the back of the car with a long trench coat on because he was undergoing chemotherapy and was quite weak. And that's uh, my only memory I actually have of him in my mind. Uh, but, you know, you've seen the pictures and so on. And it was many years ago, actually, I was uh, I, with my gran. I became a carer for my grandmother, having uh, her looked after me when I, after my parents died. And we were flicking through a photograph album and there was a press cutting in this photograph album. And there was a picture of my dad opening uh, the Liberal Garden Fete in Sutton, Nashville, Nottinghamshire. Um, and I'd always thought he'd been a Tory because apparently he played snooker at the local Tory club. But there he was opening a Liberal Garden Fete in 1958. So um, I didn't know him, but maybe there were some genes there. <laughs> a Liberal gene somewhere. And of course, you cared for your mum too when she had cancer. You, you looked after her as a, as a child carer. How much did you need to do for her, and and, and what was that like for you? Because it, it doesn't it doesn't sound as though you you got much of a childhood in a way. There was a lot of responsibility on your shoulders from a very young age. Uh, yeah, but listen, the 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 great thing I had was love. Uh, it was a very loving household, and um, both from my mum and from her parents, her, my grandparents. So I just want to make that clear, because when you've got that stability of, of a loving relationship within the family, that can take you through quite an awful lot. And uh, losing my mum and after that long illness, it was, it, that was tough and there's no point pretending otherwise. Um, we just do everything for her. I mean, um, particularly towards the last year and a half. So preparing her food, sometimes taking her on off the toilet, missing medicines, um, she was in a wheelchair uh, for quite a long time, so take her out in the wheelchair. Um, I mean, her pain, she had a very painful disease, and one of the uh, ways of relieving it was actually to put these pads on her um, with a bit of gel, and she would then give herself electric currents to sort of distract the pain. And, you know, <laughs> that was quite something um, to have to do for your mum. Um, but there was lots of positive things. I mean, you know, I would, sounds odd, but I'd lie on her bed because she was awfully bedridden for most of the time, the last two years, and I'd just sit and talk to her. And we we bought a portable telly and we watched telly together sometimes. And carers are a huge part of, of your new drive as, as Lib Dem leader. And I guess that is a lot to do with your own experience, your own personal experience. And now, of course, you do care for your son who's got his own needs. How has that been during COVID-19? Because a lot of carers say that they are quite exhausted by the experience of COVID-19 and, and they haven't been able to get the same support. Have, have you found that things have been, have been different for you? Oh, yeah, I mean, particularly during lockdown. Because um, John was taught at home and had some help and almost, not all of it, but almost all of it stopped. Now, the upside was I was uh, locked down too at home. And so rather than me going out to Parliament or going out to around the constituency, I was at home. So I was more involved in the care on you know, during the daytime and in the early evening than I would normally be. Um, so that relieved a little bit of pressure on my wife, but there's no doubt it was quite a big extra increase in, in care. Um, but from my own perspective and and i can't speak for all the others i'm sure other people had a much harder time um i had a i have a great relation with my son and i love being with him so i didn't i didn't feel annoyed or irritated by that or even exhausted um uh, i i feel privileged we have a house with plenty of room we have a garden um and i have money coming into the bank into the, my bank every month so i feel privileged um even though I'm not denying that there were some challenges. What I do know about, in, and both read about it recently in, in Carers UK's uh, quite, quite strong report uh, released early this week, to talk to carers in my own constituency, 
there are some carriers who've had a very, very tough time um, where they've just not had the support, the respite. Uh, they're worried about money. They've not been able to go out um, uh, as easily and get, get a break. So, so some carers have had a really difficult time and more people actually have been caring during this respite. I've had to do some caring than normal. Um, and so the number of carers have actually gone, gone up. And so for me, um, being having been a carer much of my life, a young carer, a carer for my elderly grand and now a carer for my son, um, I guess it, it that experience, which which for me hasn't been an, in any way an awful experience, has been with my, my loved ones, but it's taught me how tiring caring can be. There is nothing glamorous about being a carer. I mean, you're taking people on and off toilets often. You're feeding them, you're dressing them. You now, my son can't dress himself. Um, he can't walk, he can't talk. And um, that means you need 24 seven care. And that means everything. <laughs> So it's not glamorous. Um, it, I, I find it, and I found it with my mum, it, it, it was a natural thing to do because <laughs> you love them. What, what I find uh, must be trying of people who have got their own health issues and they're trying to be a carer. So um, thinking about uh, other people doing those caring responsibilities, knowing that it can be so exhausting, um, you know, I, I just feel as a, the party leader i want to speak out for them and you know there are millions of carers paid carers who are doing professionally yes uh and but many many more unpaid carers and for me this is an issue about giving them a voice um because i just don't think they're properly recognized in our society it's also um about um an equality agenda because guess what who are the people who do most of the caring they're women and in our economics system, we just don't value what millions and millions of women do. And that had to change. So as Prime Minister, which we're imagining that you are now, what is the first thing you do? What is the one policy you could change, do you think, that would lighten the load of carers? Well, the only problem with answering that directly is that different carers have different challenges. There's, not such, there's no one type of carer. So that's first of all, and I know that from my experience of them three different types of caring. And so there are things that are financial uh, because often carers are giving up a lot of money because they can't work and uh, they're doing a job which if you had to do it privately costs a fortune. So I think we need to recognize uh, with uh, better financial support to carers. So that'd be, that'd be very high on my list. Another would be passing employment laws to enable carers to juggle their employment responsibilities more easily. Um, and there's a phrase in employment law about reasonable adjustments. And I put forward a bill in parliament already on this. Uh, I happen to be patron of the a, a, a charity called Disability Law Service. So we've worked out how the law need to be, would need to be changed to enable carers to work with their employees in a much more flexible way so they can manage things. That would be one of the issues that I'd like to take forward. And another would be respite care. You know, because carers do get exhausted, absolutely exhausted. And so giving them a break, but where they feel that their loved one uh, or just the person they're caring is, is in good hands, I think that would be important. So there'd be a whole package of measures for carers and there'll be many others I, I want to bring forward, but we've got to change almost the, the way society thinks about carers. And I think, you know, because pol politics is, isn't simply just about money and laws, vital though those are. They're about how we, how we respect different, different people in society. And one thing I think we've learned from COVID is that, you know, you cannot just do, as the Prime Minister said, protect the NHS. No, no one never disagree with them on that. You've actually got to think about the care sector as well. They are inextricably linked. I, I think we saw in the in the way in the response to the to the pandemic the way that care was often an afterthought. It was often a secondary consideration to the NHS, um, and I think that probably is something that the pandemic will 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 change in in the in the public psyche. Actually, the way that we perceive care. Well, I, I'm determined. I'm determined to campaign on that because um, we've been arguing it for a long time. We've had people, colleagues of mine in the past, Norman Lamb on mental health. Paul Burst, though, another great Liberal Democrat on 
care for the elderly. We've been banging on this drum that you've got to see health and care together. And, you know, I do hope uh, the wider public now see that and they see that health isn't just about hospitals and doctors and nurses, vital though those are, they're also about carers. And we should value carers far more, whether it's paid or unpaid. OK, well, look, talking of the pandemic, as Prime Minister, you know, not everything is going to be planned. You're not going to be able to just implement all the policies that you want to. Some things are going to come along that knock you off course. And Boris Johnson's obviously learned that with, with this pandemic, which is now defining his premiership. There is this big divide in politics now for the first time, I think, in the pandemic about the response and about lockdowns. And the government was taking the regional lockdown route. Labour saying, look, have a national circuit breaker lockdown. Where do the Lib Dems stand on all of this? What is the right way to deal with this second wave? Well, we've been very clear from the start, you should follow the scientific evidence and SAGE. And um, that's why um, I take the same view as um, Keir Starmer on this, that when we saw the SAGE advice published relatively recently, it was very clear that the scientists and medical experts were saying, look, this is getting out of control. The probably the quickest way to sort to sort this is a national uh, circuit breaker for two to three weeks. And the reason why I think that is the best solution, even though it would mean some areas where the infection rate isn't as high as others having to lock down, is it because it would be the quickest and the most effective economically speaking. What I really worry about with this very complicated process, the Prime Minister is, is not even getting it sorted. It sort of changes day by day and they just haven't thought it through. It's slightly chaotic. This approach, I think, is going to be far more costly, both health-wise, in terms of people who may, may end up catching COVID, but also to the economy. Um, because it's going to drag on week after week because they don't really get a grip of it. And that's been my impression all along with this Prime Minister and his government. They've not acted quick enough. They've not got a grip of it. Um, just give me, let me give you an example. In my constituency, I represent more Koreans than any uh, European politician. So I do quite a lot of work with uh, the Koreans. I go and see the Korean ambassador. And I've been asking, how come you did so well on COVID? And they said, well, as soon as there was even a sniffer that there could be a pandemic, you know, the, the pr president, the prime minister was involved. Uh, they were ordering test kits to be uh, created on industrial scale. And they, they, they kicked in with their plans, which they got in far more detail than we had. And if you look at the comparison to Boris Johnson, he didn't turn up for the first six COBRA meetings. They were so slow. They were slow weeks after weeks, and they only even started really thinking about industrialising test uh, production much later on. So I'm afraid this government doesn't get a grip of things. And that is why, following the evidence, following the advice, we have to get a grip. And that's why a national circuit breaker is the best for people's health and the best for their jobs. But lockdown is a, is a highly illiberal thing to do. You are the leader of the Liberal Democrats and you are on the, on the most liberal wing of the party, uh, an orange booker, as it's called. You believe in, in, in the most sort of liberal version of liberal uh, democracy. How does this all sit with you? Do you not, do you not worry about curtailing people's freedoms? John Stuart Mill the great liberal philosopher on liberty talked about the liberty not to hurt someone else. And if you, as soon as you hurt someone else, you're infringing their liberty. That's what a pandemic is all about. It's not freedom if you create, have a society in which you can catch something and you can die. That's not freedom. The best way to get freedom back again is to get in control of this pandemic. It's an enemy, it's an invisible enemy, which is curtailing our freedoms because it's killing people. And if it's not killing uh, people, it's uh, creating huge problems. And we, we're now learning about long COVID, uh, which is hurting people's lives for months, maybe even turns out to be years. What's, there's, nothing, there's nothing liberal about that. And, and therefore, I, I think it's the liberal thing to do is to get on top of this disease, sort it out, and let me tell you, the most effective country, I mentioned Korea, what is the most effective country in dealing with in the world? It's Taiwan, 28 million people, I think, 26, 28 million people, a liberal government. And how have they got on top of it so quickly? Not only did they move quickly like the Koreans, but they were totally transparent from the day one. They told the, the public in Taiwan exactly what they were doing, 
and they got huge compliance because they had trust. What has Boris Johnson done? He's been slow, he's been weak, he's been unclear, he's been complex. And when his top advisor broke the rules, he just let him get away with it. And that destroyed people's trust. So I have to say a more liberal approach is the one that Liberal Democrats are adopting. There are huge long-term implications, though, of, of lockdown, partly on people's health, but interestingly as well, in terms of the economy, and, and that's topical today, as I speak to you, the Chancellor's just made a statement in Parliament with extra economic help for businesses and, and workers who are, who are adversely affected by lockdown measures. Is it a bit galling as a Lib Dem, you know, to see a Conservative government racking up huge amounts of public debt when you sat side by side with David Cameron trying to reduce the public debt and got quite a bashing for it at the polls? Um, uh, I think it's a very different situation, um, to be honest. Um, it may not seem that to some observers, but I'm an economist by training. Um, uh, did my master's at night school. And when you look at that and look at economic history, it's very clear this is very, very different from uh, what's happened previously. And um, the case for um, borrowing to keep the economy going now, I think is very, very strong. And my biggest worry is that, uh, you know, Rishi Sunak seems to be talking about a balanced budget. He wants to, you know, get back to those days. Well, I, I think he's living in cloud cuckoo land and that would be disastrous economics. And, you know, I was proud, actually, we stopped George Osborne cutting far deeper, far more quickly, which would have really damaged the social fabric of, of our country. And what I don't want to see is the Tories trying to do that again when it would be deeply inappropriate. So the Liberal Democrats will actually be the champions of continuing to invest to save jobs, but also in, to invest for that future. You know, there's another crisis alongside the pandemic crisis it's called the climate change crisis. And we have to invest for that. Otherwise, the costs are going to accelerate. So the case for investment now, even if that is paid for by borrowing, couldn't be stronger. Who do you think came off better in the row this week between Andy Burnham and, and number 10? Well, I don't think they, either of them come, come up smelling of rose, to be honest. Um, I think uh, Andy Burnham may have at times overplayed his hand. However, what I did admire is that um, you know, Boris Johnson had not offered the sort of financial package that businesses and people need for their jobs. And ultimately, if you're the prime minister or you're the mayor or an MP, you should be thinking about people the whole time. How it's affecting them, their livelihoods, their lives. And it seemed to me in that discussion, Burnham was much more on the side of people and um, uh, Johnson seemed to be, you know, all over the place and uh, not being frank and transparent. And um, that's what worries me. So, you know, if you wanted to meet, I, it wouldn't be a knockout on either side, I have to tell you. Uh, but I think Johnson lost on points. OK, all right. Andy Burnham's the victor. Maybe they will crown him King of the North after all. No, I don't, don't think it should be that. Um, I, I, I generally don't because I think there's been uh, so, some mistakes made. But however, I do think, um, you know, some of my Liberal Democrat friends in Manchester and Greater Manchester were making clear, um, people need to stand up to the way that Greater Manchester is being treated by, um, by Westminster. And you know, as a Liberal Democrat, I'm very keen on greater devolution, stronger local government, stronger voice. And I do think in this overall pandemic, one of the problems has been that there's been too much power uh, centrally in Whitehall in number 10, and they've tried to manage it all, and no one could do that. If you look at Taiwan and Korea and Germany and other countries that have managed this pandemic far more effectively, they have worked with local public health officials, they've worked with local authorities, they've been far more effective in test, trace and isolate, which is the fundamental way we're going to get out of this. And we, in this country, we haven't because you know, Johnson and Cummings et al. have tried to do it all centrally. OK, well, look, there is another small thing on your plate as Prime Minister, which would be Brexit, of course. And Brexit helped define the Lib Dems in recent years because you had that pledge to hold a second referendum, even to revoke Article 50. You've dropped that now. Are you not worried that you've sort of dropped your identity as well? Because it was quite useful for you as an electoral weapon. I know it didn't work out perfectly in 2019, but it, it did help define your raison d'etre. Well, 
uh, we are remain and always will be under my leadership and I'm sure anyone else uh, the most pro-European party in British politics I'm proud of that what does that mean I'm these days though of, I'm, I'm proud that we fought we fought the fight against Brexit I don't regret that whatsoever we stood by our principles unlike some some people and we, we we were right to do that and you know we got a lot of support on the basis of that we you know I'm very sad that we didn't ultimately win that argument but I'm not saying to ditch my principles what I'm going to do now, though, as leader of the most pro-European party in British politics, is argue for the closest possible relationship with our European friends and neighbours, because that's in the interest of British people, in the interest of their jobs, in the interest of their health, in the interest of them uh, helping to tackle climate change, in the interest of their security, and so on. And so we will remain the most pro-European party, and we will always think that Britain should be the heart of Europe. Can you imagine, though, the Lib Dems going to the next election, arguing to rejoin the EU? Listen, the next election is quite a way off. Uh, we haven't even uh, got the Brexit trade agreement done. I mean, the chaos and uncertainty. I talk to businesses uh, every week and they, they, and they are so upset about that. And so this is the answer to your question, is that you know, let us see how this works through, what the impacts are. You know, I, I'm not going to go down the hypothetical route. What I am going to deal with is what's in front of me today. And I see a government that's grossly incompetent uh, over this pandemic. You know, the British people, it's one of our darkest hours in recent years, and they're failing there. They uh, are not actually delivering what they said they would do. They said they got an oven-ready deal. You know, come on, pull the other one. Uh, and uh, it's the businesses, investment and jobs that are, that are being squandered here. It's really incompetent by this Johnson government. I mean, the clock's ticking on a trade deal as well. Talks will now actually resume with the EU. Do you think maybe those talks should be extended if if there isn't a deal done in time for the end of the year? Well, um, I expect there to be a deal, right? I mean, I think there's a lot of posturing and playing. It's just like Johnson did before. Um, it's pretty unpleasant. I mean, last time he did it over... Um, battle with the Supreme Court and, and, and Parliament and this time he's doing it um, uh, over um, you know over the rule of law and it's it brings uh, the British government into disrepute and tarnishes our reputation frankly the priority the absolute priority and all this is getting not just a deal but a good deal a good deal for British people a good deal for British jobs in the context which he didn't start off with but in the context of a COVID economic crisis, potentially the worst economic crisis seen for 300 years, and in the context of a global trading system, which thanks to Trump has broken down. Now, maybe if Biden gets elected, he'll be off to uh, rescue parts of it, but there's still those US-China tensions. It's a very different world from the world of Britain being in the European Union that Boris Johnson used to castigate. And, you know, uh, I think the deal needs to be one where we recognise those new economic circumstances. And I think you know, Boris Johnson's just got to be a little bit clearer and, uh, and more truthful to the British people. He said he had an oven-ready deal. Where is it? OK, well, look, your predecessor, Joe Swinson, was criticised for saying that she was a candidate for prime minister. Are you a candidate to be prime minister at the next election? Well, that is quite a long time away. I've just taken over the Liberal Democrats. Guess what? My priority is to make sure the Liberal Democrats learn our lessons because we've not had a good few years. Very frank with that. Couldn't be more upfront than, than that. And I want to make sure we're back in tune with the British people and we build up, uh, as we've done in the past, you know, bottom up, winning those council wards, winning those councils. Uh, bringing on really good candidates who people go, yeah, I'd much rather have that person as my member of parliament. He understands our community, he understands me much better than the Conservative, because we're normally fighting the Conservatives, let's be clear about that. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not thinking about the result of the next general election. What I'm thinking about is rebuilding the Liberal Democrats to be the party that we've been in recent times, distinctive, Principled, powerful voice in British politics. OK, well, look, let's just do some quick fire questions to finish up the podcast because we're, we're running out of time on our Zoom call. Um, Favourite Lib Dem leader of all time, Ed? Paddy Ashdown. 
Okay, that was easy for you, wasn't it? Uh, who would you fear more at the next election, Rishi Sunak or Boris Johnson? <laughs> Bring them both on. <laughs> Do you not think Rishi, though, might be slightly more challenging? Probably for you and for Keir Starmer. Easier to fight Boris Johnson, wouldn't it? They are both equally culpable in the mess this Conservative government. They're, they're at the top table, aren't they? They're Prime Minister and Chancellor. They've made a complete dog's breakfast of this. And worse than that, you know, the tragedy of the care homes, the tragedy of inaction, the economic pain that, that is much greater here because of their failure to get on top of this pandemic. They're both guilty. And I think the British people will ultimately see that. OK, well, the opposition parties are doing their best to tie Rishi Sunak into the pain of COVID-19. Rightly so. I mean, you know, he's taking the decision, isn't he? It's not for me to judge, but I've certainly seen the attack ads out there, particularly from the Labour Party, trying to tie, tie him into it as, as much as they possibly can. Um, where would you go on holiday as Prime Minister? Uh, well, uh, I quite actually like going to holiday in East Anglia. It's one of my... Uh, I love Norfolk and Suffolk. Um, uh, I have hollered all over over the years. Um, recently, we we had planned to go to France and then the quarantine rules came in. So we decided, well, we're not going to get caught by quarantine. And we went to Dorset, where my mother-in-law is. And I love Dorset as a county. So it's got beautiful English counties. So um, uh, I'd probably uh, want to holiday uh, you know, as a staycation if I'm prime minister to make sure I'm not too far away from the shop. Nice. And lastly, what would your Downing Street pet be? My pet? Well, um, normally it would be a dog because I love dogs. The only problem is my uh, doesn't like dogs and he gets a bit afraid of them. So we can't have a dog. Um, you have to um, compromise in a good liberal democrat way and I go for a pussycat. Oh, lovely. OK, I mean, there aren't enough cats in Downing Street, are there, quite frankly? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know, you ask me. I mean, I've been brought up with dogs and cats and um, uh, I, that may not sound exotic, um, but I think if I suggested I was going to uh, become a, uh, a lover of snakes and spiders, I think that might become a story. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it did become a story for Gavin Williamson, didn't it? So, um, look, Ed Davey, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a pleasure to interview you. We've got a prime ministerial press conference coming up now, so we both better go. But thanks again for yeah. coming on. I'm sure we'll learn a lot. <laughs> thanks a lot, Ed. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.